Luke 11, verse 24. Here there is a debate by those who were uninformed about the things of God and saying the disciples are doing things that we think are from the devil just as many sincere Christians could be spoken against. There is a row of chairs at the front if you'd like to sit. I asked for it. Luke 11. I suggest you take it home and read it. I think it's about as far as we're going to get, I think. At least I quoted scripture. Luke 11. We were watching a program the other night, God TV, and it was from Toronto, Canada. And the conference was entitled, We're Still Laughing. And it was packed with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who were being set free. If there's no fruit, forget it. But if chains break, if liberty opens up your spirit for more of God, if you become aware of the presence, then whichever way the spirit moves, you move with it. And he's not so repetitious that you can copy it all the time because he just moves a bit differently according to need, according to his purpose. And um, Luke 11. Now that here we have this debate about how do you know this is of God? They accuse Jesus of casting out devils in the name of Beelzebub. 
Beelzebub, you know, is the name of Satan, but it's Lord of the Flies. And they were saying, you're actually, and your disciples are actually moving in the wrong spirit. And you'll find that religious people will say that about aspects of the Holy Spirit manifestation. That can't be God, because that doesn't happen to us. Can't be God, it's not part of our tradition. Can't be God, we haven't seen it this way before. But when God moves, God does a new thing for each generation because it's the new thing that has the power to break the pattern of the old thing. And when an old thing has finished its course, it no longer cuts through what is happening on the very edge of the modern world. So the Holy Spirit just not only keeps up with it, he's ahead of the trends of this system of the world. He's ahead. And people who are in the Spirit, they just keep with the Spirit and they have machinery of the Spirit, anointings of the Spirit that are well able to tackle the problems of the day. That's how it works. Dead religion doesn't cut it. Dead religion can't cope with the needs and so people stay the same, unchanged. But God is changing his church from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit. And our focus is, Lord, we're looking to you in the light of your word and we're coming with you. So God does new things. And yet they're all scriptural because he's done it before. But in different seasons he moves in different ways and he captures the heart of those who trust him and love him and they move with him. Great things begin to happen. Wonderful things begin to happen. If you've ever read the history of revival, there has been no revival that has been planned by man to be a very neat, clean little package. Because three things happen when the Holy Spirit begins to move. Number one, the Holy Spirit indeed begins to move, save, heal, deliver, restore, revive, and things begin to stir. But secondly, demons begin to manifest because they're dislodged by the anointing. Those things that have hidden in the soul of man, those things that have hidden behind damage. And that's the scripture I'm looking at in Luke 11 where they're saying, well, what you're doing, you're casting out the devils uh, through Beelzebub. This is not the way it should work. Now these are Jewish converts, they've become Christians but their understanding of God is probably a little bit negative. They've got a, a heavy, um, un an understanding of a, of a heavy handed God and you'll find that as they begin to hear the truth they're set free from some of their thoughts about the nature of God, the way God moves uh, out of the whole realm of guilt, condemnation, shame which religion had put upon them. And so they're going now, we don't recognise what's happening, it doesn't look neat, doesn't look clean, we think it could be Beelzebub. You're casting out devils by the spirit of Beelzebub. And Jesus said, then the kingdom is going to absolutely fold in upon itself because a divided kingdom cannot stand. It's either going to be the kingdom of God with the finger of God doing the work or indeed it is the devil and he's doing the work. And he began to explain how this works and this has always thrilled me when I got a bit of revelation about it. Verse 17, he knew their thoughts and he said every kingdom divided against itself is brought to nothing. A house divided against itself falls. If Satan be divided against himself, how will you say this kingdom will stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. But if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, shall they be your judge. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. If that volume went down a bit, I'll just raise my voice. Verse 21. When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he takes from him all his armour wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters. That's a very powerful statement. Whoever is not with me is actually scattering and dividing the kingdom. If you're not moving with the way I'm moving, in fact you are working against my purposes. You might have your religion, you might have your traditions of men, you might have your outward form, but you're denying the power of the Holy Spirit working in the midst of you. This has always been an issue within the Christian religion. There have been those who, letter of the law, have got their own thoughts of how it should be, how it should look, because of 
often negative connotations with religion and God not being a good God, a God of judgment. Well, he is a God of judgment, but the judgment was given to Jesus and was fully given to Jesus to the degree that he was separated from the Father's heart for that moment at Calvary. He became sin, cut off from the Father. Full judgment came on one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, he's a God of judgment, but he judged Jesus and he pardoned us. That's why Christians have the good news of the gospel. That's why we rejoice. That's why we, we happily spend an hour in praise and worship and could go longer. And the days are coming in revival when it does go longer. And in fact, one meeting rolls into the next meeting and uh, one night rolls to the next night. And the next thing is days, weeks, sometimes months of more and more anointing pouring out and hundreds and thousands of people starting to draw in. You might think Perth is not interested in revival. They're waiting for it. What they're not interested in is dead religion. They want to know if I can get into the presence of God, whoever, whatever that looks like, and if I can be changed, that's what I want. And I'll bring my kids, and I'll bring my neighbours, and I'll bring my friends. Because everybody knows something's terribly wrong. They don't know that it's sin at the core, unrepented sin. It's actually not a sin problem, it's a sinner problem. The sin problem is already dealt with at the cross. But the sinner problem doesn't understand it. Revival is going to be most attractive to one massive group of people and totally repulsive to religious people. They won't handle the freedom. They'll think it's irreverent. They'll think it's a license to do whatever you want to do and they'll run a mile from it. But you watch, mark my word, people will start to gravitate towards where God is moving by the Holy Spirit. And you'll find it throughout the city, so many places where hungry, thirsty people gather. Numbers will start to increase. First, We've been through the time of humiliation in the body of Christ. We've been allowed to be seen in our present weakness, but we're about to be seen in our future glory. Hallelujah. The church has been seen to be weak because, in fact, there is weakness and there were faults and there were failures and uh, we didn't clean up quick enough. So God exposed some things and we've been through that. People laugh and mock, where's your God? You Christians all fight each other. That kind of sentiment has been around. But it's changing, hallelujah. Because when they hear that kind of testimony and your testimony and my testimony, they won't laugh at it. They'll think if that's possible, then I might need that same power in my life. Many people will think that way. That's why they're attracted to New Age philosophy, New Age religion, trying to find help, trying to find power, trying to find something that will help them feel better. You and I have got the answer. His name is Jesus. So here we have the whole thing of the uh, kingdom of God, kingdom of darkness. One has a strong man. Tonight we're breaking those chains. It says when a stronger one comes, that's Jesus, he's the stronger one. Verse 24, when the unclean spirit's gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he comes, he finds it swept and clean. Then he goes and he takes to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So here we have a warning that we need to be 100% sure we want God before we start playing around with the things of God. We need to know this is the truth that I am embracing. This is my belief system. I own it for myself. My heart is connected to it. Rather than, oh, well, I'll try it, but my heart also wants this. You'll have great conflict. You'll have major spiritual opposition. You'll have, you'll have war. But when the heart is converted, conversion is the heart. With the heart, man believes. With the heart, man believes. Not the head. You can't argue someone into the kingdom. You can't push him into the kingdom. You can't drag him into the prayer line to get him saved. You can't say, say the poem and you're saved. No, no, it doesn't work like that. It's the heart needs to decide that's the truth, that's what I want to embrace. I don't understand it all, but that's what I want. And then at that point, there's a genuine conversion, a regeneration. The Holy Spirit comes in, that human spirit is now born again, and we can begin to walk in the ways of God. But it says that if a spirit is taken out of the person, 
and that room is empty, it's clean, because the word makes us clean, but it's empty, then he will come back and say, I'm going to go back to my home, I'm bringing uh, other spirits with me, because a spirit, disembodied spirit has no power. You could have a, a spirit of fear sitting up on the corner behind the light there. Is the light afraid? Is the wall afraid? Is the window afraid? No, it has to have some kind of expression through, through people or animals. Spirits also go into animals. That's why that dog looks at you and the fangs appear and you think, oh my gosh, this is more than a dog. I've seen possessed dogs in India. I tell you, watch out. They, they, they come near you, you can almost see the devil in the eyes. And we know the scriptures about animals and how <laughs> spirits can come in and so on. Actually, you've got a beautiful little cat at home, he's probably not possessed. But I do remember praying for somebody in Fremantle. We were praying and we were sort of getting this person free and we were really going for it. The cat would have been 10, 12 feet away took one almighty leap, landed on me with his paws. And I was going, in the name of Jesus, the cat came. The fear then ended into me. Well, you know, I, mean, I needed deliverance myself. I've got such a f- blooming fright. I thought, You're, I'm praying for you, but this cat's possessed. <laughs> True story. Before God, I tell you, it frightened the wits out of me. Because I didn't see it coming. It just landed on me, claws and all. But oh God, they live in animals too. According to scripture. But the stronger one is Jesus and it says that he strips the enemy's armour. He gets hold of the armour and he demolishes it, pulls it down, takes it away. I've said this before numbers of times. You, you and I have armour, the, the armour of God, the protection of God, the truth the force of righteousness, we have faith, we have all these things that keep us safe in the nature of God. But the enemy himself, he has armour, he hides behind. And according to this scripture, it's within the human being and within the soul of the human being where the enemy can come and, as it were, hide. It doesn't mean people are all full of spirits, but it does mean that spirits have access to the broken parts. Spirits have access to the unresolved issues. Spirits have access to the anger that hasn't been dealt with or the fear or the rejection or you name it, so many areas of brokenness. That's why I I say get hold of the word, let it wash in there, get that stuff out as soon as you can. Get help where needed. How do you know if you need help? There'll be patterns. There'll be similar responses to the same sort of promptings. The same trigger will get the same response out of you. You don't need to, to ask anyone else, is it a negative response? You'll know. And so we say, okay, these are the areas where the word's got to work and penetrate and get in there and I've got to demolish that which the enemy hides behind. So what does he hide behind? Attitudes. He hides behind thoughts. It says it's like a house. Let me say it to you according to the way I see it in Luke 11. It's a house of thoughts. It's a house of thoughts. The soul is mind, emotion and will made up of the thoughts because of the experiences of life and the emotions that are attached to those experiences and those thoughts. So you can have a house in, as it were in your head and you can have a room of fear and you can have a room of lust and you can have a room of hatred and you can have a little area where there's anger. And how do you know it's there? Patterns. I'm often feeling this way. I can't forgive them. That's something that needs to be dealt with. I'm not focusing on the negative. What I'm trying to tell you is that once we recognise the issue, then we can know how to get the word into that area and we get the answer. So Jesus said that the stronger one comes and he brings down that armour. He removes the armour so the enemy cannot hide. So if you clean up the room of fear then spirits of fear will not be attracted to you because there's no atmosphere conducive for their, for their expression. So they'll go to someone else who's got a clean house and it's empty because it's not full of the truth of the word of God yet, not renewed, mind's not renewed, you're not meditating day and night on scripture and so there's an area where it's sort of like empty. I no longer want to think of the bad stuff but I haven't yet got into the good stuff and there's this empty area. 
the enemy will come and say, that's conducive to me, there's fear there, there's anger there, there's jealousy there. And he may hide behind the attitudes and the thoughts. So in fact, it's not just pulling spirits out, it's putting truth in so the spirits are no longer welcome there because the atmosphere is different. The mind is renewed. He's not going to come and live in an area where God lives. He remembers what happened at the cross. He remembers that Jesus triumphed over him. So all the attitudes, all the thoughts, all those negative things, we need to just say, it's not who I am anymore either. And I thank you for the truth of the word and these things go, I forgive, I release and I'm set free. Now that's an important truth because if we do not have our own soul restored, we're forever with internal conflict, as, even as Christians. I've been around long enough with Christians to know some people do not have a joyous, overcoming Christian life. They're hanging on because they know there's no other way, but they're not fully enjoying it yet. Would God expect us to come to him and not enjoy it? He wants us to be the most fulfilled and the most thrilled of all people on the earth. Someone wrote a book called The Happiest People on the Earth. They're Christians, but they're Christians who know the truth. Not just born again and still living with fear and anxiety and worry and depression and sadness. No, they're, they're dealing with those things. Hallelujah. And you and I are dealing with that. I don't want these things anymore. I'm changing from glory to glory by the Spirit. It has happened, it will happen and it can be completed because Jesus comes back to a perfect church. So what is the plumb line? How do we know how we should think and feel? Well, there's one person, Jesus himself, is the fullness of that stature of the measure of what God wants for us. It's the character of Jesus. Once you've got the character of Jesus, you can be entrusted with the power of Jesus. And these are the two things I want to leave with you. Number one, go for character. And that's where the John 15 says, Abide in me, live in me, settle down in me. The old life finished, your new life is in me. The way I think, I feel, I respond, I... It's all in you. It's Christ in you now. So forget the old thinking, break those patterns and habits of thought and begin to accept the new according to scripture. It's a bit of a fight but it's worth it because once you've got character forming within you and it's Christ-likeness, you become a man of peace, woman of peace, joy, love in the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful thing to have peace when you never used to have peace. It's a wonderful thing to know joy and joy is partly what we saw tonight with laughter but it's, it's deeper than laughter. Joy is the sense deep down that everything is working for my good. It might look bad, it might sound bad and sometimes it jolly well feels bad that my God's turning it around for my good and I'm so happy about that. That's the joy. And sometimes that joy will bubble up with laughter. Laughter is good, it's like a medicine. A merry heart is good like a medicine. Have a good laugh. People have often said to me, don't let them laugh in church. What would you prefer? Hand out tissues at the door and we all cry. Is that better? Well, it is in terms of religious expression of what we've seen in the past. You know, the frozen chosen have gathered and we're so sad about our weakness and our sin and our inability and our condemnation and our guilt and our shame. We can't possibly laugh in church. This is such a deadly serious matter. Would you just die quickly and get born again then? So you can enjoy? A friend of mine got saved at a great big um, outreach and he went into one of the... probably shouldn't mention cathedrals, but anyway, I just did. And he was so happy, so joyful, so thrilled he bounded down the aisle going, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, first time in church. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, he's so happy. The deacons came up and said, we do not praise the Lord in this church. <laughs> he was stunned. We do not praise the Lord in this church. What they were really meaning is, we don't praise the Lord like that. How dare you come laughing? He probably danced, knowing him, he probably danced down the aisle. He was so happy. He said to me, what do I do? I said, don't go back. Find a place where they're all laughing and dancing. 
And he did and he became a pastor. He, the happiest pastor I know. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord. So there are two things. One is if you want to have Christ like this, means you have to have purity. He is pure. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a holy spirit. He, he, there's a purity. There's a purity. And if you and I want to be pure, it won't be from within our own capacity. It will be receiving his Holy Spirit. And the Spirit has control. Purity. I love purity. There's a generation that is so soaked in sin, they will love purity. Believe you me, they will love purity. A generation that seem to be awash with sin and we all think they're really happy with it. They are not. They're broken hearted. They've been betrayed so many times. They've been used so many times. They've been sinned against. Their moral boundaries have been broken so many times they think this is all there is to life. Do you know that people not only sin by making the wrong choice, they're sinned against, often very young, violated, not just sexually, but in whichever way would break the moral boundary of trust and love and security and safety. And once you break the moral boundary of someone's life, the spirit that you're operating in goes into that life, which is why hurt people hurt people, damaged people damaged people. People who have been victims of rape and things like that, they find that there's these urges within them to do the wrong thing. But it's not their heart. A spirit was, was attracted to them because the boundary was broken. It, 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 it's like a hatred within me, a holy hatred. When I see people whose moral boundaries are broken and then they're broken and then people condemn them for their sin. But they were sinned against first. They inherited that junk either through family generational inheritance or through bad behaviour, usually of people who should know better, people in authority, people who are older, that kind of you know, victimisation. Didn't expect to go down that track, but anyway, we went there. And people who are sinned against, I feel so sad, because I know damn well that wasn't their option and choice. It's just put on them. Praise God, Jesus says, but I'm a stronger one. And when I come, I'm going to break down the material that the enemy hides behind. The thoughts, the attitudes, the feelings, the resentment, the bitterness, I'll pull it down. But your job is to say, now that I'm clean, I've got to fill it up, fill it up, fill it up, fill it up with the word. So now I've got a house of purity. I've got a house of, of love. I've got a house of joy. I've got a room full of peace. Yes, it's your spirit, but your soul is now re is washed and renewed. Isn't that awesome? Go for purity. Fantastic. Secondly, then you can be entrusted with more power. More power. More power. People who go for power without purity do damage. You can be powerful and still not Christ-like. You can have strong gifting and uh, uh, misappropriate it. You can have strong anointings and abuse people with it. You can have prophetic insight and dump it on somebody rather than the faith that works by love. I mean, I, I look back over the years and things that sometimes people say, you, think, you don't know what damage that did. I'm talking even personally and probably I've done it to people and perish the thought that I want to, but sometimes, you, you know, you just do. Oh yeah, but God shaped me something about you and boom, dump it on them. Makes you feel better. I got a gift. I've got insight. This poor person has just been abused spiritually. Only that which is for the good of edifying. Only that which is for building up. Only that which is for reconciliation. Only that which works for healing. Only that that makes someone feel better after you've spoken to them. When you leave their company, you feel built up. I felt special. I think they like me. Well, Christians, more than like, we love. And yes, we don't do it perfectly. But we've got the capacity to do it perfectly. Just die to self, expel the darkness, put in the light and just live. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. Hallelujah. And then power comes. Acts 1.8. Wait till the power comes. You, you and I have power. We have seeds of greatness. We are men and women of great destiny. Can I, can I say to you, you are significant in the kingdom. You have unique gifts, you have unique dreams, you have unique talents. 
don't, don't be stereotyped that what you see is the usual pattern. Now, if I serve God, I've got the following three choices. I could join the choir, I could hand out the notices, <laughs> or I could pack up the chairs. I mean, praise God for the servant heart who does it all. Is that as far as I'm allowed to dream? No, no, that's just to test the servant heart. So get past that and say, but I'm dreaming of something big. Hallelujah, I'm dreaming of really doing exploits. I'm dreaming of changing my generation. I'm dreaming of rescuing abandoned kids. I'm dreaming of feeding the hungry. I'm dreaming of setting captives free, healing the sick, delivering people. Dream big, because God in you is greater. He's, in fact, if you can do it without God, it's far too small. It's got to be something impossible then you know God's in on it. Purity and power. Hallelujah. Preach myself happy. I'm going to ask my brother, how are you feeling, bro? You feeling it right now? Good? And, and when you go home, you're going to have a bit of a, a check to see how that foot's going? How big was the hole? Are you kidding me? And like an open wound, is it? Do you expect when you go home something to be different? Do God did something for you out there? Feels good? Yeah. You don't want to have a check now, I suppose, do you? Because 200 people are hoping you will. <laughs> it's your testimony between you and God, but I'm expecting something to happen. God is a God who says yes to prayer. It's always yes. But you've got to hold fast your confession of faith until you see it manifest. Sometimes the miracle, sometimes the process. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay, who'd like Nelly to pray for them? <laughs> I wouldn't do that to her. Well, actually I would do that to her. <laughs> but if anyone does need prayer and encouragement, welcome to come. Nelly, if you feel dull, you've got the strength, I'd love you to come with the team and just pray for a few people. Is that possible? Be all right? A woman of faith? Anyone who's never given their life to Christ? Never given your life to Christ? Anyone not filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues? Do you desire that? If you were here last week, probably close to 40 or 50 people spoke in new tongues for the first time. Some had spoken in tongues previously, but they got a new tongue. And several got tongues for the first time. Also, hey, bro, do you speak in tongues? Come. Are you sure? <laughs> Not some African dialect. <laughs> you pray in tongues? Do you do it often? In the Holy Spirit comes on you. Do it even when you don't feel he's coming on you because he's in you. And I'll tell you why. Because I can see behind you people who've got um, not your welfare at heart. There's some, there's some mischievous friends. And they're doing their best to get you out of the kingdom of God. And they want you to go down a path which is not good. even involves violence. Is this true or am I making this up? It's true. What are you going to do then? You're going to stay with the Lord. How are you going to get rid of the, old, the three old pests? Hmm? Five, five minutes? No, 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 no. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got friends who want you to let go of God and go and do bad things? You're not doing it? You haven't done it yet? Have you been doing things with them? Just reach out to him. Father, strengthen him, 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 strengthen him. In Jesus' name. And Lord, unless your friends want to repent, remove them from it. If they want to repent, then that's fine. But we cut the chains, we cut the ties. It's like it's like a gang thing. A gang thing. 
just goes around, we just sever it, sever the chain, sever it, get off! Let them rest in the name of Jesus.